are you satisfied with the brutality and the outcome it gave you at Christmas party on the Pro the, the ethos of what your gripe is. I don't think anybody's asking you mm-hmm. the right questions, personally. I'm not trying to justify or your verbiage or your had the same no. views of Ridgefield Park and the quote unquote Mecca, right? Here's the thing. What do independent promoters do a lot of times when they see a great building? Everybody wants to latch on to it. You gotta not right? be polite about it. And, right. and here's the thing I say about it because our society is very soft. You know, and here's how I would equate it, right? And this is where I equate wrestling today on the independence, okay? Let's just say you want to be, a, your goal is to be a... Not many people in professional wrestling, on the independents, even to a degree on television wrestling, as we're now calling it more and more and more, are legitimate. There are not many wrestlers that can say they left their territory. They popped their town, if you will. And not by popped as in a reaction. Popped as in they left their local geographics. There are some talents across the independents that if you say a certain name in California, in Texas, in Colorado, in Missouri, St. Louis and such, they'll say, oh, I know that guy. They may have never crossed paths, but they're aware of their work and their transcendence. This is a gentleman who I consider to be more than a journeyman, but rather a legitimate competitor. This is a man who has the accreditation, who has the time, who has the miles, who has the grit, if you will. And in my opinion, contrary to many, both on and off cameras, I do agree with a lot of his opinion, contrary to what the masses may get offended by. And speaking of offended, we will talk about that and other things. I'm talking to me with one of my favorite independent professional wrestlers today and someone that I truly have looked up to for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, the Messiah of old school, Sean Donovan. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you. I appreciate that uh, very uh, prestigious introduction by you. Uh, I've said it before. I'll say it again. You have a unique broadcaster's voice and approach uh the way it comes out with all the work you do it's uh it's a breath of fresh air because uh you take pride in your craft so thank you for the introduction appreciate you having me on always love to talk shop whenever possible that's that's nice to hear you know it's always good to the new sexy term is get flowers i don't get them often uh, so that's always cool, and I'm not like other announcers yeah. who look for them every day on Facebook. Yeah. But enough about I don't, that. I don't, I don't, I don't look for flowers either. If people yeah. want to give them to me, I beyond appreciate it. But I don't go out looking for them. So right, right. Um, you know, I and kind of similar to uh, someone else will talk about uh, change fair. I really took the time to study you. Um, I'm sorry to hear when, that. <laughs> when when I first met you back in uh, either 2017 or 18, because I'd heard of you, but, you know, I was doing the Stone Cold. I, I, I know you, but I don't know much about you, you know, so I, I was really going down this rabbit hole. And then during the pandemic, one of the great things you did for not just me, for the independent wrestling community was you had your, your they were podcasts to a degree, but they were more like workshops. Yeah. And, and I think they were extremely informative. Uh. I know that my absorption rate with a lot of the stuff that you were teaching was, was really retain at a high retainment level. Um, and I think that comes back to where you started, where you come from, just confirming you're an IWF guy, right? Kevin Knight. That's correct. That's where I got my start. And at the time, specifically in the New Jersey area, especially like, again, being an accredited school from the independents. Cause you know, this is also at an era where wrestlers, from mainstream television, WWE, WCW, even ECW are not coming out with schools just yet. These are a lot of the enhancement guys or the mm-hmm. guys who rub those shoulders and elbows doing it. And mm-hmm. uh, and and Kevin Knight had a very accessible school close to the PATH train near most uh, bus rails and bus lines in Jersey, the light rail, things like that. Um, I've only seen Kevin. Uh, I've, I've only met Kevin one time when he's doing some of his skits and stuff in Times Square because he's always been kind of like – trying to get eyes on his school and, and the product and him. He's a very unique individual. Uh, unique is uh, probably the right word you could use yeah. when it comes to Kevin. So 
Yeah. Um, different era of wrestling when you're getting in. You're coming mm -hmm. in post Monday Night War, pretty yep. much. A lot of things in the independents are in their infancy. The independents are not just starting, but it's a huge renaissance period, right? Correct. The, the independent wrestling scene in the late 90s, early 2000s, as kind of hot as the industry was, there were not a whole lot of independent wrestling companies a lot of individuals that are in wrestling today do not understand that the abundance that they have today just was not there right. at that time. The the biggest you know thing I I can kind of accredit to those who may be listening to this that are from that northeast, maybe New England area. You see how the New England area has exploded over the last number of years with so many great promotions. Yeah. When I first came into the industry in 2001, there were maybe two or three promotions mm -hmm. running out of the New England area. And one of them was Chaotic Wrestling, yeah. uh, which was actually still known as, uh, you know, the, the Kowalski School mm -hmm. um, as their school attached to it. So, and that became the more mainstream one also because the other two or three kind of suffered from that. Correct, yes. They also so got then, a lot of the talent that didn't get accepted. but Correct, yes. And there were a lot of great talents that came out of that Kowalski school that I had trained with um, you know, at that time and had done shows up in that area. The Northeast was kind of known as the hotbed, but to a degree – there still were not as many well-recognized promotions running. A lot of them were just really what you would call spot shows, like these right. small shows that would just pop up every now and then. I mean, you still had the major players in the early 2000s, which was, uh, you know, you had Jersey All-Pro Wrestling, you had uh, Ace Wrestling, you had... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah, IWF was, was running, but not to that scale. You had NWA New Jersey that was running. Um, that was Ricky O, right? No, Ricky O was JCW, uh, NWA New Jersey that ended up turning into NWS was, uh, two old school car, call them Carney promoters, Dapper Johnny and Gino Moore. Oh, you see, um, I, I, I know Dr. Johnny by name, but okay, because right. I, I know Ricky O was at least affiliated with uh, NWNJ at one point. Yeah, yeah, and then going into Pennsylvania, you had PCW, which was Phoenix Championship Wrestling that was run by uh, Donnie B. You had guys like mm -hmm. Steve Carino up in that area. So, you know, you still had your Monster Factory. You still had your ECPW with Gino Caruso. But really, the, those were really like it. You know, yeah. there there wasn't as many places to go. So you had no choice during that time mm -hmm. to literally go into the wrestling magazines, find the results of where these shows were. And then use drop the, them down. Yeah, use the internet in its infancy. And I say that in 2001 because really the internet was around for about five or six years at that point. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, you had to go into the magazines and find the addresses of where these upcoming shows were. And, and as a young performer trying to get out there, you just had to take the chance and make the drive. You know, there was no phone number to call up the promoter on your old school wall phone and yeah. say, hey, can I come help out at your show? You just had to drive and, and hopefully you could meet somebody and, and hopefully network that way. So, you know, where the young talent today really has a an easy tool at their fingertips with social yeah. media messaging. Um, back then it was a different era and not to take away the talent today, but I think the talent back then, because life was different, there was a lot more drive from a lot of those talents to really get out there because they had no other way, but to do it that way. Right. So it's kind of just like promoting an event, right? You can use social media all you want, but you got to pound the pavement. You got to hit the town. So the yeah, other it was thing a, you bring up too that that mm -hmm. really and had had you not gone through that list, I would have never surprised. I would have never realized this comparison. You named so many great promotions, right? Some of them were even pioneers for their era, whether they're still yes. there or not. But of those, say twelve promotions, you could only learn and train at about five, Correct. and it's 
pretty crazy how we're at an era, which we'll get into, sure. where there's so many promotions now, regardless of how often they do or don't run, but you can only go learn and train at about five. Right. And now do you, because you're a coach, obviously you're, you're doing great things, great teaching, fundamentals. You're giving these kids a great foundation with the with actual ring training, ring drills, preparation before even giving them a match. Other feds give them a match on day two. Do you do you think I'm saying the truth? Do you no, you're, think you're, you're not wrong? You really are you know, wrong. Unfortunately. And I'm very polite about it, right? No, so I mean, hey, you know, sometimes you got to not be polite about it. And right. and here's the thing I say about it because. Our society is very soft at this point. I'll be it frank is. in saying it. So, you the know, nation, if, if, not pro wrestling, the nation, the nation, right. But that kind of delves into where our industry is at too. Right. Sure. Um, I, and I've seen it. I've seen students walk in our school, not for them. Mm -hmm. They'll go somewhere else. That's easier. Mm -hmm. You know, there is like, I've said it in promos. I've said it before, right. There is no elevator. You got to take the stairs. There is no shortcuts. Yeah. You know, anyone who's in any industry will always tell you, take the road less traveled. It will yes. benefit you more in the long run. And when I say that, and I say this wholeheartedly about this industry, and if people want to get butthurt, go for it. Yeah. When it comes to aspiring pro wrestlers in our industry, I classify you as two types. You either have a dream and you want it, or it's something cool you want to try doing. Yeah. If you have a dream in anything you want to do in life, you will stop at nothing to achieve it. If you have an idea of something cool you want to try, sure, a small percentage may excel in that. I want to try it and it's cool. The majority will not necessarily put their full weight into it. And right. that's why so many people fall off the beaten path and you never hear from them again or yeah they'll go to an easier school but then they will just stay in that small bubble and those are the same individuals that will then complain that they weren't given the right opportunities in reality those individuals did not look themselves in the mirror mm -hmm. when it came to the area and the era and the time that i came from and i think more schools need to be this way and that's just my personal opinion my original school, my coach did not want part-timers. He right. told you right off the bat, if this is something part-time for you, go find another school. He wanted people that wanted to make it for two reasons, right? And a business. The more people that make it out of your school, the more prestigious your school is known for, sure. the more business your school and your promotion is going to do. Uh, you know, it was a different time. You were basically told if the school's open four days a week, you need to be there four days a week. Yeah. And the only reason why you should be missing class is if there's a death in your family. Correct. That That's really it. And to me, that just bred a very different mentality for me and those that came up in that time. But that's how a lot of us got to where we got to and got so good so quick because we just became sponges. And and I, you know, people who have known who my original trainer, Kevin Knight, is, a lot of people have different opinions. I have my own opinions of him. Great trainer when it came to the basics. You know, when it came to business strategy, eh. Right. But, you know, um, still a great trainer in the basics. But a lot of my, my business side and psychology side yeah. of the industry – was taught by guys like Chris Candido and Balls Mahoney and Dr. Tom, who would frequent our school right. for seminars, um, scouting, and guys like Chris who just wanted to come up and get a workout and would just yeah. literally show up in his in his uh, you know Sergio T Ticano uh, 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 sweatsuit, take off yep. his fanny pack, and would just jump in the ring with everybody, yeah. and then would just sit and talk to us for hours till one or two in the morning. So. You know, undeniable knowledge and there. You from sat people. there and you listened, which, no matter what era it is, not everybody's going to do that. Because going to right. your point, you might plateau yep. at, all right, I did the four days. I'm tired. I got to get up in the morning for whatever. No, 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 but no. You're there sitting, listening to them. Yeah. 
And, and and at the same token, right, then you're getting on the road, then you're going to shows where a lot of these guys are on and you get to sit in the locker room and you get to listen. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the mid 2000s is when seminars were like very, very big in the independent wrestling yeah. industry. Yeah. You know, you had the shoot interview DVDs that were out by RF video, mm-hmm. plethora of knowledge. And yeah, a lot of people wanted to watch the shoot interviews because they wanted to hear the juicy stuff. And yeah. to me, that was not something I was ever interested in. I wanted to hear the road traveled. I want to hear how right. they trained, how right. they learned. I, I want to be a sponge. You know, obviously, a lot of the gentlemen I learned from and had seminars from back in the day aren't really around anymore. Yeah. You know, you, you know, I've I've done Raven seminars. He's not doing seminars these days. You know, I've done Ted DiBiase seminars, you know, all those guys that understood how to get to the top of the industry were the guys that I was going to seminars and learning from. For example, going to Killer Kowalski school and learning from Mike Hollow, who was a basics master, who, if people know the name Mike Hollow now, he owns Elite Pro Wrestling Academy up in New Hampshire. That is one of the first schools that are ID'd by WWE. Uh, Tremendous trainer um, in his own right. So, you know, it, it forced a lot of us back in the day to the only way you could learn. You know, there was no YouTube yet. There was no yeah. Facebook. There was the, none of that. The instantaneousness and the convenience was not available to us. No. And even and, though and it is available. Millions, there's millions of dollars of wrestling knowledge available for free now. Correct. And that even though. have that luxury. Right. And even though it is right, you still have to go out and you've got to do it. You've got to go out and you've got to own your craft. You know, again, whether it's instantaneous or not, there is no substitute for putting in the work. And when I say that, it's not just going to a school once a week and training. You know, we're in a very instant gratification society. We have individuals who train for three months, four months, even six months. Right. They, some schools will give you a nice graduate certificate. All of a sudden, people think, oh, I'm a pro wrestler. I can just hit the road. No, you still got to train. Yeah. You still I think haven't one gotten of the, your feet wet. That's it. I, before I get into some questions about your training, because sure. I'm, I'm fascinated by the training process of different eras. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that I feel like damaged the business was because Steve Austin had his podcast. Mm-hmm. And I think he stressed – that pro wrestling and he was not wrong is on the job training and you learn more and you know, you're going to learn in the ring you're going to learn the matches and have different opponents. And I feel like when that quote came out, because that quote came out during my era, I started in 2014. I think he said this in 15 or 16 in his podcast. And a lot of the guys took that quote as, Oh, I got to work matches more. Well, how long have you been working three months? Huh? Some of these people, have not been to regular training on a weekday since. So are you having the same matches? Because if you're having the same matches every weekend, what are you really learning? No matter who the opponent is, because we all know guys, Sean, who are like, well, he's going to have his match. That's right. the term. You know, oh, you're working such as, oh, well, you know, you're going to have his match. Right. Because that's the only gear the car goes in. As opposed to continuing your training, continuing this, continuing that. Part of why WWE established a performance center Right. Is for anyone to go and train. A part of the reason why most guys go and live in Florida during their career is because they have access to it or they live near a school or a ring or they put one in their house if you're fortunate enough. Um, you know, uh, I mean, if, if it wasn't for things like wrestling with shadows or, the, or things like this, you know, Brett had a ring in his house and he had the ring that he was going to be in at all times. Right. You know, we've seen through the years, Taker would order a ring. And, and get his shit together. And these are guys that didn't have to, and they did. So, so I, you here's know. The, here's how I would equate it, right? And this is where I equate wrestling today on the independence, okay? Let's just say you want to be, a, your goal is to be a basketball player in the NBA, right? right. So you're going to start playing hoops as a kid. You uh-huh. might join Little League. You might try out and make your high school basketball team If you become good enough, hey, you might make it to an accredited college and play there and have a potential to be drafted, right? 
no different than playing football, no different than playing hockey, right? Right. So here's the here's what I'm gonna throw it out at people, right? Why is it? In the world of professional wrestling, you don't have to practice and train, but yet somehow you can make it on a show, embarrass yourself in front right. of whatever it is, and all, all of a sudden think that you are going to just make it to a national television company. Right. There's no substitute. You have to train. And this is where wrestling is it pisses me off because this is where wrestling gets a bad rap and gets disrespected, right? There are more shit wrestlers in this industry than there are good ones. Sure. And you can tell from the moment they walk into a locker room, how they act, how they dress, what their gear is. Are they in shape? All those things go into being what's supposed to be a professional industry and it get and we get a bad rap for it right yes in the beginning sure you're gonna have to do those shows that are not so great because yeah. you need to get repetitions right but it starts from the ground level up we've all said it find the legitimate schools that are out there find re do your research who are the coaches where have they been what have they done does their school look professional does the ring look safe? All of those things, right? Then find out what the training curriculum is and then go from there. And yes, right. I understand. Yes, you do have to get repetitions on live events, but it's when you are ready. Right. When you're ready, when you've had your first pro match after the right amount of training, if you have the right coach that's putting you in that position, then when it's time to get out there, then you start making your way around yes mm -hmm. are you going to have to work people on your level sure are you going to get the opportunity to work people that are more experienced than you yes will you get to work some name talent you might everything is a learning process right. but if you try to jump the line and you start developing this ego that you don't need to train honestly shame on you because right. you never stop learning right mm -hmm. I'm doing this two decades, and I love to still train. I love to get in the ring with my students and learn from them, teach them, uh, try something new. I love getting in the ring and training with people that are more experienced than me and learning different techniques and things of that nature because that's how you get better. That's how you make your matches on shows better and different. Sure, your first day of training, if you go to your school and the first day they're showing you how to do a cutter and a Canadian destroyer, you're probably at the wrong school. Yeah. Right. You know, pro wrestling training is not easy. No. People think it really is. And when I've seen people who have joined our school and I can tell people right off the bat, I've been doing it long enough. I can tell you about how long they're going to last. Some will surprise me and, and they stayed and they kudos to them. The majority I've been spot on about. Um, and I tell individuals who come to check out our school, it's not my job to find out from you what kind of physical shape you're in from a fitness level. But if you want to join and be a pro wrestler, I will give you some tips of what you need to do to get started. Give yourself 30 days, depending on your fitness level and be realistic because I want individuals when they do pay that money and join to have the best possible chance to succeed. Right. I'm not going to be that old carny trainer who sees money in somebody that I'm just going to take their money from them. That's not the right way because and that's you also not touch on something with fitness. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah, you got to got, you'll get these guys who they're like, I lift this, I bench that I'm on the treadmill two or three hours a day. And then they hit that ring, baby. And the, it's true that ring shape, that ring cardio, there is, is no substitute. Legitimate is just as legitimate as our industry. Correct. You've seen boxers have said I, who have tried pro wrestling said, "No, I'll stay a yeah. boxer." Right. Yeah. And and don't get me wrong, there are individuals who've been able to translate into that process, and I always even tell our students, 
there are certain exercises you can do that will get you as close to ring shape as possible, but there is still no substitute for actually getting in the ring and doing it. There's so many different things that are involved that individuals don't realize. Sure, you can say, oh, I can do this because I watched it on TV. That, that's right. great. You might have an idea, but you'd be surprised how many people get in a ring and, oh, I can run the ropes. It's easy. And then all of a sudden they try and it, it's really not that easy. Right. Um, and again, that's where schools, if they're the right schools, they will build you on a foundation with a legitimate curriculum to build you the right way and to do it safely. Because again, telling people, and I've seen this on independent wrestling shows, guys who are not in great shape and they're trying to go 10, 12, 15 minutes and they're gassed after right. five. And then here they are late in the match and they can barely pick up somebody safely. Look, we all know the cat's out of the bag, right? What we do is predetermined from a right. story standpoint, but what we are doing in there is legitimate. It is physical. People can get hurt. Lives can be lost sure. if you don't take care of the people you're in the ring with. Um, and that's something that actually just sticks in my craw when, I, when I'm on certain shows or I even see clips online. And I'm just like, how in the world did someone let this individual in a wrestling ring? You know? Right. That just, I, I just don't understand how this industry can be made to look very foolish, but yet every, every other sport is considered legitimate. Um, right. I truly believe you have to be an athlete to do this. Um, you have to be in physical shape and, and yeah, I mean, sure. You, you, you can come into a school and say, oh, well, I can bench 350 pounds. I can squat 500. That's great. But can you hit the ropes for five minutes straight without falling down and blowing up? Right. right. It's, it's a different, different style. Together. Right. So, you know, when it comes to training and it comes to wrestling schools, the coaches have to take their curriculum seriously. But the individuals wanting to learn have to take it seriously, too. Right. This is this is not. Yes, it should be fun, but this is not the wrestling friends and fun business. This is the wrestling business, yeah. right? At the right. end of the day, as a professional wrestler, yes, your goal is where you want to make it, but it's a business. Right. You need to treat it as such because the goal is to make money. Right. And I, and I have the saying with a lot of my friends in the business where I say, I love how pro wrestling all of a sudden becomes a business when somebody finally wants to do business. You know what I mean? Because it's it like, is. no, it should be should be business all the time. I'm not saying have a stick up your ass and walk around, you know, all clenched and stuff. But it is business at the end of the day, right? And and you're We're here you're hired to for draw a money. Yeah, and you're hired for a service all the same. Correct, and that's where individuals need to understand the professionalism side, right? If you're right. working for a legitimate promoter, right? The way I look at it is, if you're booking me for your event, you're hiring me for the day. Right. You're my boss for that evening. My goal is to come into that event and do what is asked of you that you're looking to get across from me or my match on that event. Correct. Now, will I have ideas on how I think we can get there? Sure. I'm going to present those the right way to the promoter or the individuals putting that show together. But ultimately, if the way they want it is a certain way, okay, with my knowledge and experience and the other person's knowledge and experience, how do we achieve that goal? That is the goal. Within that, yes, you're going to have certain outliers and bullet points. You yeah. have a time for your match. Stick within those times. Don't be that guy that's that you say, Oh, I've got eight minutes, but then you just clearly disregard that and you go 10, 15, 20 sure. minutes. Um, and then you ruin the show for the rest of the other matches because you thought it was okay to do that. You know, you're here to do business at the end of the day. Maximize your minutes. A promoter tells you got six minutes, go five and a half. Give them 30 seconds back. It'll actually pay off in the long run if you sure. do business the right way. 
but that's the other issue. We can, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole, you yeah, know, and, and any way you too, want. But the other thing too, you, you hit a lot of channels that, that I totally tune into, but the other thing too, and, and this constantly comes up for debate and those mm -hmm. who do this are the ones who agree and the ones who don't are strongly disagree. Mm -hmm. When I get booked and I'm very realistic in my bookings, when you book me 30 days in advance, 60 days in advance, X, Y, Z, the moment we have agreed on the fee, because that's the part nobody that people want to leave out the fucking conversation. The moment we've agreed on the fee and the date and the time and the venue, because I can get there. It's public knowledge. I don't drive. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, I can get there. We're good. Cool, right? My booking has started. I'm aware I'm not a wrestler. I am not a draw. I say that to people. It's maybe overly realistic, but I am not on the poster. Um, you know, I am not uh, an attraction by any means. The locker room may feel good that I'm there because I might facilitate the story they want to tell that evening. Okay. But what I'm getting at is between sharing, liking, commenting, and again, I'm not a wrestler. I, I'll even be nice and not call it a promo, but you get that match card video out of me. <clears throat> and if you've promoted enough matches, I'm going to do it on your go-home week. Why on your go-home week? Because now I'm selling your card. So, yes, you know? indirectly, you may not be on the poster. You may not right. be a main draw on the show, but what you are hired to do right. is to enhance the event in the other ways that you are booked. Sure. As an announcer, as a backstage announcer, a commentator, whatever it is, you are 100% right. The moment you get that date, the booking, everything... It is now your responsibility as a brand for yourself, whether you're a wrestler or commentator, promoter, uh, uh, ring announcer, to promote the event you are on. That means sharing the poster, sharing the match graphic, along with the poster, sharing the link where people can right. buy tickets. If you are a wrestler, who cares if there's no story to your match? Cut a promo and right. create one. Right. You can create your own scenarios in that promo, getting people who may have never seen you before get to understand who your persona is. If you don't cut a promo and you don't share, maybe there's somebody out there who knows who you are that had no idea you were on this show. Right. And sadly, it happens more often than not. When I work promotions, sometimes I'm added to a private group chat, and I cannot tell you the amount of times I have seen posts from the promoter getting on people about sending promos in or yeah. promoting the events. That's another area we have to look at too, right? We're in a social media-driven society. Right. This is a content-driven society now. If you want to be a pro wrestler and you want to get yourself known – why wouldn't you put as much content out there about yourself and your bookings as possible? How can you legitimately be a professional if you're not promoting your brand? If you don't have any social media presence at all and you're a pro wrestler in today's society, what are you doing? Right. Again, are you playing pro wrestler or are you trying to go out there and get it? It's totally up to the individual. To me, and I've had conversations with promoters too. I tell some, I've told people, if you book a talent on their show, on your show and they barely promote your show, they don't cut a promo, do anything, right? If it's two weeks before the event and they haven't done anything to promote your show and yeah. no funds have been exchanged in terms of a deposit or something like that, my suggestion, find another talent, debook them, and find somebody else that will promote your show. Or, okay, use them on that show once, never use them again. Right. And the other thing, too, and, and this, we didn't talk about this on Sunday because we, we had to save it for here. You know, I, I'm, again, realistic. It's my wheelhouse. Look, there's an era, guys, I'll be nice and label it that way, that are scared of promos, which is not okay. But if you're aware of it, okay, sure. But you sharing two weeks or the week of a show 
is not the same as like hitting the share button, which is free, by the way. Right. Hitting the share button from the moment you get the booking to the outset of, because now I have a belief that more so for Jersey bookings, um, somebody lives 15 minutes from what you're doing, not where you live, what you're doing. Somebody on your timeline is near that town that you're performing at. And by the time you get to that go home week, that person's made plans. Right. They, so, Cause they're, you know, that whole, Oh, I'm coming to your show. I'm coming to your show. You, you never know who the hell's coming. You never right. know who's so, going to come see you do your thing. So I think for just, your local uh, part of the local part of your timeline, but then for yourself, get the shares out there and it just looks good too. Oh, this guy's here this weekend. This guy's there two weeks later. Perception, you know, perception is reality. Is it and a huge part of our business? Right. Yes. And I'll, I'll go down to what you said on two pieces right now, just kind of finish what I said before about people sharing things, yeah. right? Yes. At the end of the day, the person running the show, promoting the show, yes. Is it their job to promote their a event? Absolutely. Their primary absolutely. Group. That is 100% the on the promoter themselves, yes. whether they're yes. just doing it through social media. If they're hitting the local towns around the area of the show, that's great. But it is up to the talent as well to help build that house. It is right. imperative because if you build the house and more people come, the promotion makes more money. You work in front of a hotter crowd, a right. livelier crowd. And if the show does well and everybody does their part, chances are the promoter might want to bring you back. Right. But going again into a social media mode, again, being a professional in our industry is understanding how social media works, right? Sure, you can just click the share button, but it's not going to get the same amount of eyes as you actually taking the poster and posting it on your own. There are algorithms. There, These are things about our industry people need to study yes. and understand. If you are not the most technologically inclined individual and you want to be in this industry, again, it's part of learning everything about our industry and how everything works. There's articles out there. There's videos on YouTube. Watch it. Talk to people who are very good at social yes. media. Pick their brains, right? These are all the things that go into being a pro. And, and I say this all the time. This is where I said before, you never stop learning about right. our industry. But you have to be... And I say this with any sport, any industry, if you want to be the very best you can be, you have to be a little psychotic about what you're doing, right? Oh, yeah. You have to yeah. eat, sleep, breathe yeah. it, and you know what else, 24-7. There, there, there is a lunacy in passion. There Correct. is. I'm a, I'm a firm believer of that. And, right. and, and how wicked that web gets woven is sometimes out of your own hands. Correct. But it goes beyond desire. There is, in fact, a lunacy. Yes, because have, I can tell you, you to, from from you day to one. Yes, to jump around in your underwear in front of five hundred people every night, you and know what throw. I mean? And as my girlfriend likes to say, throw yourself on a on the floor, right? right? Because that's about what the ring feels like sometimes. You know, at and the Bobby, end of Bobby the day, did the analogy of uh, we got a great job for you. And you're gonna make you're gonna make uh, uh, a lot of money if you stick to it. Uh, is my transportation paid for? Oh well, no, you're gonna have to pay for that on your own. Oh, will I get free meals? Uh, no, you're going to have to take that out of your check too. Um, if I join, will you guys put me in like the most luxury hotels? Honestly, there might be some nights where you're sharing a room with like three other dudes. Uh-huh. And then uh, will I perform in front of a live audience? Not at first, but someday you will. Sign me up. And that's you know? the lunacy of our <laughs> industry, right? So, and I've said this before, right? Lots of people that don't understand pro wrestling or are not, into it will never understand what I say we do, right? Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. But you have to be crazy about this industry. From day one as a fan, I would go to Blockbuster and literally rent the same tapes every single week and burn them out and watch and watch and watch. And then when I got into the industry, it was the same thing. 
all of us in our school, we're all trading whatever tapes we have. We're watching whatever we can. We would have a live event and then our trainer would sit down and we would watch the show the next day yeah. at training and we would break it down and we would critique it. We would talk about it. I would be on my off day on the phone with my friends who I'm training with and we're yeah. just talking about it. You yeah. have to be crazy. Jobs I've worked at, lunch break for 30 minutes, I'm on YouTube. Yeah. I'm yeah. watching something, right? Yeah. It's whatever it is. My off days, right? Sundays are a family day for me. My significant other likes to sleep in. I'm up at seven in the morning getting about three or four hours worth of tape study in. So that way, you know, when that person gets up, I have that day to spend with that person, but I got my time in, right? right. You have to consistently study this industry or any yeah. industry you want to be in 24 seven. You have to legitimately be crazy about it to yeah. be good about it. To and be then good here's the it. other thing, because you're giving so much advice. I want to put this out there for, for announcers because I feel like this is the new habit. Does it help you to mute Monday Night Raw, SmackDown, AEW, MLW, whatever it is, because I, I watch what I can um, as much as I can. Uh, does it help to mute that and go on the fly? It, yes, it does. But you know what else helps? Listening to yourself back. You know what else helps? Working with other partners. Because I'm going to say something I've probably never said out loud before. I shine the most when I have a combative partner. When I have a Jesse or, or a Heyman, that's where I shine the most because that's kind of where my foundation is from the tape study standpoint, right? Those are my roots. That doesn't mean that I can't give you the, the news Walter Cronkite style of a Michael Cole or a Corey Graves. But when you have that combative person where it's like news radio and you get hot, you know, it's compelling, you know? So I think working with other partners, hearing yourself back, because also if you're calling Monday Night Raw on mute by yourself, who are you jousting with? Are are you that symbiotic where you're where you're you know turning into split and you're you're talking to Teresa also? You know, are you that out? You know, you got to be aware because you might be getting a lot of reps in, but what are you lifting? Well, are you getting quality reps in? That's right, the other sure, part sure. too. And and let's go down that rabbit hole for a second too because. Again, part of our industry, and I guess, again, not every company or promotion has the top of the line production or even commentators or yeah. things of that nature. But again, what are we doing here in the industry these days, right? We're seeing a lot of places who probably even shouldn't be running shows, right? That's We're awesome. bringing on commentators who have never done commentary before have never done or taken a broadcasting class. But because they have a podcast right. about pro wrestling, again, somehow that qualifies them to be in the wrestling industry. Shame on that person, but more so shame on the person running the company, allowing these individuals into the industry with absolutely zero experience in any level of the industry. And I will say this wholeheartedly, right? Because I'm doing a podcast now myself, right? 80, 80 to 85% of wrestling podcasts are just fans who are armchair quarterbacking, thinking that they understand the industry because they watch interviews or read dirt sheets or watch Monday Night Raw or AEW Dynamite, whatever have you, but all of a sudden now they're qualified to be a commentator on a wrestling show. Right. Good right. Lord, man. Have you heard some of these people on a microphone? It's like they're talking with M&Ms in their mouth. Yeah. The charisma is like, it's like the charisma they have is like of a deaf mailbox. Half their verbiage and, is foul language. Right. So again, where have you gone to study your craft that yeah. makes you qualified to be a broadcaster in wrestling. I'm not saying that there are many places to go to be a wrestling broadcaster, right. but you can go to broadcasting school. You can take public speaking courses. You can learn about the industry like you just said. 
learn how to maybe try and commentate with the volume on mute, right? right? These are all the things that are dumbing down our industry as being legitimate on the independent level. And that can, you could have the greatest match on the independents. Sure. What can kill it? Horrible commentary, right? Absolutely. I have had matches that are very good. And, and again, I watch it back with the commentary and it's just foul language filled. He hit F in this with this. And this, I'm like, where's the story being told, right? Again, we talk about professionalism. And how many shows... Matches. How many shows do I ever have a commentator on that actually comes up to the talent and says, is there anything you would like me to get across in your match? Do you have a name for this move? What's the goal of the story of your match so I can help enhance it, right? Now, these guys just get there and they sit behind a microphone and they 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 think they're Gordon Soley or whoever they are, and they're really, they're, they're not. And I'm sorry to be very brutally honest, but that's what needs to be Ex, uh, exposed in this industry um, in order for us to become legitimate, right? It has to be legitimate on all fronts, yes. right? Especially because, especially because you just said it has to be legitimate on all fronts, right? Because I have, this is going to offend people and even it might offend you. Everybody says wrestling so hot right now. Television wrestling is very hot. Do I think it's reflective of the indies? I don't, but I think the awareness of the indies is the highest it's ever been. Correct. Yes. Right? And are so, there, yes, they're, the so indies, that, they're coming yes. in. It's like you take your kid to Disneyland and then you take them to Rye Playland. You're talking apples and oranges, right? So if you take right. your kid to WWE and then you take them to an indie show, depending on the age of the kid, they're happy to be there, but they're like, right. Oh, this isn't Disneyland. That's what I'm getting across. And a part of that convincing a part of that presentation, that legitimacy is some of the things you've touched on. The ring and its quality, the dressings, the aprons, the curtains, all that. The entrance, guardrails, no guardrails. The venue itself, the lighting, the commentary, the ring announcer. You've seen it. You've been around. The ring announcers in the shorts and the Hawaiian shirt and this and that. All of that stuff plays the part yes. of the perception and the acceptance, the selling and the registering. Correct. When you go to a professional quality event right let's just say you go to the circus right yeah if you walk in and take your seat and you just see a farm animal covered in shit walking around the whole area you're like what am i watching what is this right, right? right. you see a, the ring that's supposed to be lit on fire for the lion to jump through was just hanging off a string right it it, yeah. it doesn't look professional and this is where again we are at a time in our industry where let's just face it, right? You've seen the videos of some of these places out there, right? Anybody today can go on high spots and buy a ring. Sure. Anybody can rent out a VFW hall for a couple hundred dollars, put a garbage bag on the door and say that's their entrance. Right. Right. But you have to look at the overall setup, right? When you walk into an arena for WWE or AEW, you see the professional looking ring, you see the lights, you see the guardrails are right. are straight. There's not a hair miss. There's guardrail covers. There's a nice entranceway with a ramp. All the seats are lined up perfectly and there's an ambiance to it. It's the same thing when you go to an independent wrestling show, whether it's in a recreation center, a VFW hall, a high school gym. All of that matters to that paying fan walking in that door, especially if it's their first time. They've never seen a wrestling ring before. Make sure it's set up dead center. It's perfect. The ropes are taped correctly. The ring is flat. It's got a nice height. The aprons are on nice and tight. All the chairs around the ring are evenly done. Right the right amount of chairs and they're all straight. There's not a crooked chair to be found. Even if you don't have guardrail covers and you have guardrails, make sure they're professional quality and they are set up and straight correctly. If you have concessions, make sure when that person walks to the door, you can smell the hot dogs and the popcorn cooking. You have professional individuals at the front door taking tickets. 
if you have performers selling merchandise, they have the merchandise table set up. You have the cameras are in place. The music's at the right level. All these things make a difference to the paying customer. And then after that, once the butts are in seats, now it's up to the talent, the quality talent to deliver a show that builds to an um, incredible main event Right. That's also potentially left with a cliffhanger, maybe. Yeah. To draw people back in for the next show. Mm -hmm. These are so many, and, and, and it's the same thing inside the ring, right? It's not about the moves. It's about the small details and the story. It's the same thing in the setup. It's the small details that go a long way to build an incredible show, right? What looks worse on a wrestling show when it's match three and that apron is starting to droop? Uh-huh. And nobody notices this? Right, right. I mean, and I and I guess here. because and I guess because of the way I was trained, it got to the point where when I first started, it because it's funny bring that up. If I didn't tie that apron the right way, I got my ass chewed. And it got I, to the point where it's not that I didn't want to learn. I was afraid of the ass chewing, so I'd avoid it. And then on a day it was, here's how you fucking yes. do it. And, and I'm, it. I'm and the same way. With you again. Helping you know? <laughs> to run shows for WrestlePro and my experience, I'm very, very detailed. And when everything is set up, I'm walking around and I'm checking yeah. everything are the ropes tight are the aprons tight are the chairs set up the right way and if anybody that's been on shows where i've helped run them or any of my students know yes i am if there's one thing i am very anal about it's chairs being set up the right way and it's the whole production right you want everything to be done the right way because sure. you want fans to come back that's that the goal one of the things they teach, they taught me in sales early on, and it was the number one thing with any client I had doing it for, for almost 10 years, customer service is an experience, right? <laughs> Where's like, customer service today, right? Exactly. And then, oh, well, Amazon's being, what are you doing to compete? Because it isn't just going to Best Buy and buying this and leaving. There's, there's people who are like that, right? Because there's times where I'm like, I'm going to go to the store and get my shit. I'm going to go. Then there's people who you want the... Uh, they want the education on it. They want the talk experience, as we call it, because they want to buy it there. Yes, there's people who just take the education, they order it on Amazon, whatever. But if I go into a store then, there, and now, and it's and I have it, why would I, depending on the experience and the knowledge and the presentation you gave me, why would I then leave? Correct. And I why would I then wait your... another? I went to the store. I wanted this. You told me all about it, and I'm going to go against you and order it for a five dollar mm -hmm. difference. Correct. Yep. Yeah. I can tell you, I understand where you're coming from. In my yeah. shoot job world, I worked in high levels of management and retail for yeah. 17 years. So I understand how sales work and how it translates yeah. to our industry. Everything matters. Visuals matter. The right presentation of the product matters. Yeah. All of that is such a key piece. And then when you have the meet and greets with the professional wrestlers, right? There's an old sales tactic that is called transfer of ownership. When you put the product in their hands for them to feel it, mm -hmm. it's no different than that fan going up to that wrestler, meeting them, shaking their hand and being up close and personal with them. That is a transfer of ownership. When you are in the ring performing and you interact with the crowd, that is transfer of ownership. Whether you want the fan to boo you or cheer you, you want them invested, you want them involved, right? That is what you're looking for. Are you going to get that with the very green wrestler off the bat? No. No. But if you put them in the right position 
with the right person who can lead them, they can help bring them up and you will still get a good match, right? Now, again, that's a different rabbit hole we can go sure. down at some point altogether. But these are all things that lead to the ultimate, in my opinion, making your event legitimate to the paying customer, right? Right. I, I don't understand these promoters today that are just okay with drawing 40 people. If you're drawing 40 people at $20 a ticket, chances are you probably don't have performers on your show that are getting paid correctly or getting paid right, or you have wrestlers on your show that probably should not be on that show. Right. <sighs> Everything translates. Now, can everybody be the hundred or one thousand dollar wrestler? No. No. But there are still good quality talent out there who want reps. And I'm not saying it, you know that's a different question uh, yeah. of a financial yeah, no, rabbit getting, hole. But it, it goes back to the quality and quantity, right? Because Absolutely. you might you might get the wrestler who's two grand fresh off of WWE, but they may not give you a $2,000 performance. And everybody goes, oh, well, what did you expect? Well, I didn't want him to give me WrestleMania, but he gave me this match and he only drawn me that much. And don't give me, oh, well, he just got out. You're his third book. No, 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 no. You have to have a form of realism and realistic expectation with everyone that you book. Correct. And, I, and, and it's like, it's to a point that you made. You know, if you give two guys 15, you know, they're going to give you 10 and you know, the guys you gave 15 are going to give you 18 and it's all, and that's a different rabbit hole to coin the phrase that's right. about card placement, things like that, that nature. Of what, course what now, but here's the thing. Other people have to understand too, right. And yeah. aspiring wrestlers who are trying to make it and come up in this industry who want to work good places, right. There's not a whole lot of money when you're young on the industry to be made. Is there some? Yes. Can you make money off of merchandise 100% to sure. get that extra income? And if you do it right, more than your envelope. Correct. Promoters have a certain budget level. Yes. There are still great talents out there because if the talent believes in the product that the promoter is putting out there, and they help with the promotion, and they help with building the event, and they slowly start to see the crowds getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If you're the right promoter who values your talent, eventually whatever that base pay was you agreed on is going to go up. Absolutely. And now when it does and the performer gets that bump, and they're getting the consistent booking by you in front of a good crowd, they're going to want to continue to come back. They're going to want to continue to put in a great effort. And if you're a promoter that likes to do stories and getting people invested, that talent is now learning how to work stories. It's a win-win for everybody involved, right? You can't just be that wrestler out of the gate that says, oh, yeah, I want 100 bucks." Right. What have, what have you done, right? Because if, if, if I'm a promoter and you tell me after being in the industry for six months, you want $100, I'm going to say to you, well, if tickets are $20 a pop, can you guarantee me five butts in seats to value that $100 you want? I don't know if you are, don't know if you aren't, but I, I can't take you at your word face value right there unless you have some longevity and time that shows me you're a draw. By all means, right. try to prove it. But that's, again, we have to be very realistic in a, quote-unquote, unrealistic type of industry. But, yeah. again, that's, and, and, you know, and another echo, rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, to echo something that, that yeah. you brought up talking about announcers, and this is just kind of like, and and you you will tell who is who is absorbing this message in one direction versus another. If, first of all, be aware that, Announcers, unfortunately, just like talent, are expendable. 
um, get but only so comfortable. Um, and also know that you might be able to do everything, but know what you're the best at. Because I am, listen, it's out there. I never say things like this. I have been a commentator. I have been a ring announcer. I've done the backstage interviews. And I can tell you which of those three I am the best at. And I'm best at a, at a table, at a headset. I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm saying where my talent shines the best, my ability, is at a commentary table. Sure, if your ring announcer is sick or unavailable, I can go in the ring and I can give you my best performance, but that's not for everybody. Correct. We are at a point where you cannot plug every backstage person in commentary, every ring announcer in commentary. I think the talent and those involved, and I get it, in a pinch, what are you going to do? But that breeds an animal that you weren't ready for. Correct. And I think that's something that talent and promoters alike um, have to be aware of. Yes. Because ultimately that one time you let them, now they're going to use that to get other bookings. And look, I'm very comfortable. You're not taking a booking from me because there's enough wrestling for all of us. Good, bad, or indifferent. There is enough wrestling for all of us. And, and I'm very comfortable with my abilities and my bookings. But I know some are not. Right. It comes and with also, it comes with entertainment. You right. Know, and, and I think that's something that has to be echoed from my realm. Yes. And same thing on, on a, a, a promotion level too, right? People have to understand when you are reaching out to promoters about working for them and for their event. Yeah. Study where they run their events. Sure. Take a gander at how many seats are in that building. Because if you're looking to fill your calendar and you're looking to get reps, the biggest thing that hurts a lot of performers, especially young performers, is when they try to outprice themselves, right? Right. Don't outprice yourself. Know where you're looking to perform at, right? There's still great places to perform and get a rep in and fill your calendar but you have to be realistic about what the promoter can afford, right? right? That's just the way the industry is. Also, if you know people, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying work for a quote-unquote brother rate all the time, this and this and sure, that, sure. right? But the people that you know in certain places that have done right by you, do right by them, right? right? Know what they're trying to achieve. Sure. Don't break their bank. Yeah. Look, we all want to make a ton of money. Sure, we all do. It's no secret. But again, you have to be realistic and you will catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. If you treat those people the right way, put it this way. Would you rather make one have one booking with somebody at fifty dollars, mm -hmm. or would you rather have four bookings making two hundred, three hundred dollars? Right, because that promoter might say, "Yeah, I'll use him for one event, and that's it. He's, he costs too much money." Right. Or would you say, "Hey, okay, if you can guarantee me four events at this." I'll do it, right? Because right. what you've now done is you've now secured four bookings yeah, to fill your calendar. Right. And then, you know, another lot of things too is that instead of developing a rapport with promoters, we're also in an area where we're manipulating them. But that's a separate rabbit hole altogether to go. Well, yeah. And, and here's the thing, right? No one should really be manipulating anybody. Unfortunately, no, that happens in our industry too. Um but you know, again, I, I digress on that one. Like you said, that that yeah. that we can we can do a whole other episode now, on something, something like I wanna, that. I want to get to get back to rather all the way at the start of this. You're sure. at Kevin Knight. You're there in IWF. Mm -hmm. How long in your training before your first match? And what did you? I asked this of everybody on the show. What did you get right away? Not get right away? And what was your like? Oh, oh, this. Oh, I don't know. Shit. You know, like. Stuff like that. All from I, it could be anybody. I always ask the talent that. I will give you all the credit in the world. No one has ever asked me a question like that, and that's actually a really good question. Pretty tough, right? So it took me approximately six 
months to have my first match to Which where the my average of that era and what should be six to nine right. months in. And that's, have, yeah. And that's six that. months of training four days a week, right? Three hours a class, two classes on Sundays, a beginner class. How and much when of I was that is about, training and drills and open ring? What's what's that like even? Because every so, that. yeah, absolutely. So our classes were all drills. There was never such a thing as really open ring. Sure. We also had a Sunday advanced class that a beginner could not go to unless they were invited. And it was consistent drills, cardio, conditioning. And I say this because I would mm. never put our students of today through this training. My training early on still stemmed from where my trainer was trained from and right. part of that old generation, right? Every class was a minimum 200 squats, yep. 100 push-ups, 200 jumping jacks, go do a mile around the building, come back, we're going to do wind sprints, this and this and that. Then you get in the ring, which is like 45 minutes to an hour later. Now you're just going through bumps and bumps and bumps and bumps and bumps, and you're hitting the ropes for three minutes at a time. Once you're done with that, okay, now we're going to start learning chain wrestling. Now you're going to start learning the basic fundamental uh, spots in a match. And you wouldn't progress to the next part until you got that part right. And I'm not right. just talking about hitting the move right. I'm talking about footwork, positioning, ring positioning, how you shoot somebody off correctly proper placement in order because if you are not in the right ring placement and let's say you give somebody a hip toss if you give them a hip toss and they're too close to the ropes they don't have the ability to get up the right way and be able to turn and then safely be able to take the next move this was all building for that six months right. four days a week and were you still, um, this is the era of when you got it from a bump, left leg first, right? Is correct. that still very prevalent also? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. And and other ways, there's different flavors these days today yeah, too. Sure, but sure. Eventually, that's that's something you learn as the fundamentals, and it goes one of two ways, right? Eventually, you break that habit or it stays with you forever. But that correct. was a huge yes. thing in my, in my training because, again, generational, mm -hmm. like a recipe, it's passed down. Right. But that wasn't something that evolved. So I I, I had to, I always ask. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, like, oh, left leg first to get up. Were you, were yeah. you in there? And same thing, you know, just dawn on my memory too. The first two weeks of my training, I never even got in the ring. Yeah. I was learning how to do everything on mats first. Right. right. Because safety first. So, yeah. What I struggled with very early on was psychology. I was learning the moves, mm -hmm. but for some reason I was having a hard time of how you put it all together. Sure. How but long, eventually it takes how time. Long did that, how long do you think that took you? To be very comfortable with wrestling psychology, a couple of years, maybe right. even That's four right. years at the very right. most. I'm very happy with such an honest answer sure yeah and, and i would think, say one of the things that i will got, say like you got wrestling yeah. which you never get wrestling but i hope you know but convey, like compared to when i started like oh it's shit's making sense now about six years in yeah and yeah. that's six years of consistent shows yeah training learning the other area i wasn't very good at in the very beginning was promos yeah, I did not have I, I was I have no problem. I've said this on other interviews before, too. Right. I was bullied very heavily in school. Uh, I was the overweight kid, so I didn't have a lot of confidence. But wrestling gave me a certain level of confidence because I was in a safe space with people that were like minded that wanted to do this. So right. they helped me. And I learned from uh, my cousin who is and has uh, done stand-up comedy for well over 20 years. 
he's the one that told me about a company called Toastmasters, which is a public speaking improv class. I went and took that for three months to learn how to speak. I invested in myself. And even though my promos weren't and in great, your confidence. correct. Even though my promos still weren't great, I was able to get past that shell and be able yeah. to speak in the ring in front of a, a live audience. So those to me were the areas that I struggled with. And when I had my first match and I actually went back and watched it recently, you could tell it's my first match, right? I'm very worried about making sure that I did everything correctly, that I really did not try to engage the crowd. Right. But again, that's just part of the learning process. Lucky for me, I had a good dance partner in that first match who was basically a natural from a personality standpoint and already had about six to eight months ahead of me in training and is to this, help guide is this me through that. Because I saw that, that is, told, right? Yep, that is yep. correct. Yeah, so yeah. How, how, how far along was Eddie at that time? About six to eight months probably ahead of me um, at that point. So, um, you know, and, and Eddie is an incredible person yeah. to this day. Yeah. Um, you, you know, still have a rapport with him. Um, no, and and not on a bad way. He right, right. decided to move on from Kevin's school. I would say maybe six or seven months after my first match. Okay, okay. He was there with a couple of friends that were training there, and when they left there, uh, they went to train with uh, Mike Quackenbush, which helped start Chikara. Chikara, yeah, and he was so, and Eddie was a true pillar of foundation for Chikara for a long correct. time. Yes. And you know, it's funny, the very first time I did extra work for AEW during the pandemic, uh, when they were filming in Daly's place was yeah. legitimately the first time I had seen Eddie literally in 20 years. Please tell me that. Our story. careers had just gone in completely right. different directions. But As they do said hello to each other, had a great conversation for a little. Yeah. And like everything is in wrestling, it's it's like you saw each other yesterday. Yeah. You know, and, you know, very happy. And that's another thing that young wrestlers need to understand, right? Stop being selfish when it comes to your peers, right? Everyone gets to the dance at different levels in their career and at different times. And some may never make it, but please be happy and genuinely happy for your peers. Stop yes. with the, stop with the bullshit brother, brother, this, and then you're burying them behind their back. If you know, people are good, just spread good karma to people. Stop yes. wishing bad. Stop saying why him, not me. Okay, what did this person do to get there that you didn't do? Right. Just be happy for people because the more you spread good karma, the more it comes back to you. And, you know, not to get into anything specific, but I've always been of the mindset, treat people right because it's that old phrase you'll meet the same people going up as you do on the way down yeah and if you meet those people along the way trust me it will come back to you in the right way and it has for me in different platforms in different opportunities and in, in different levels so just treat people right at the end of the yeah. day no one says you got to be best friends no but no. treat people with respect at the end of the day um, but also to the same level too, please understand, and I say this to all wrestlers of all experience levels, this is a work. It's not real. We're here to do business. We're here to entertain fans. We are here to do a job. Know what your match placement is and how you are in that role to help build 
to where the show is going. Right. Yes, it's an individual sport to a degree, but it takes a team of people on a show to build the house. Right. Now, and and I bring this up because he was one of the first guys that I saw. I mean, if you look at era, every era of wrestling, there's always these guys. But for my era, he was one of the first that I saw that I labeled as like a hybrid. And I didn't realize your relationship, your rapport with this man. Um, Chris Candido and his impact in pro wrestling, not just the tri-state area following, you know, the dem- demise of ECW and things like this and WCW. Chris Candido is so important because he's one of those guys that there was not a damn thing he couldn't do. He was of a smaller size. Say what you want, but he always had a sick body, okay? And he was doing things. There's certain guys like Candido, Sabu, Nunzio, X-Pac, Jerry Lynn that did things 20 years ago that we haven't seen since. And I think Candido... I think I don't think Pioneer does it, but it's a very, very in that, you know, in that pantheon of verbiage, it it's it's in that it's in that avenue. Um, he is one of a few that should be on a Mount Rushmore of individuals who are labeled as the most underrated performers absolutely. to be important yes. to this industry. And some of his best work wasn't seen because, and I mean no disrespect, because I was look, I'm I'm a Northeast guy, I love DCW, right? When he fi- when it finally clicked, and he kind of just did the black trunks with the diamond and and the knee pads and the and the patent leather boots, and was doing the back in black and showing off him turn up to eleven. So much of that fantastic work was seen on, but only such a level. And I think yeah. that I think that's my gripe because even if you're like, oh, but then he went back to WCW and he had all these great matches with such and such during this era, that wasn't the platform it should have been at the time. Oh, but he was a body Donna. Yeah, but we only talk about one singles match of him from that era. Oh, but he was so good in Smoky Mountain, but only so many people know about Smoky Mountain. But everybody who's a student of the game knows Chris Candido. Isn't that something? Right. What, yes. what an anomaly. Yes. hundred uh, percent. What was and... he like as a as a trainer and, and as a mind? Because fun fact, X amount of weeks before his passing, Chris Candido was going to be the head trainer of the old Ace Academy on Sip Street, uh, on the third floor. In Union City. And there and there's a picture of uh of course, nobody knows who has it. Uh, there's a picture of Mike Morgan, his two or three original partners, Candido, and if I might be fumbling the story, either Tammy or somebody else took the photo, and got then it. he and then he got on the plane, and what have you. So he was Chris come back from that TNA taping and and worked the deal. Right. So Chris was very influential to me and another another a number of other people in the early parts of our career. You know, of course, anyone who knows Chris passed in 2005, right? He was very big from coming to uh, my school from, I want to say, about 2002 to about 2004. He would He would frequent our school because he's a New Jersey guy. He did not live that far away from West Patterson, you know, and there were times he would come up to the school by himself. There were times he would drive up with Balls Mahoney because they were all, again, living in that same area. Chris wasn't necessarily a trainer per se, but the biggest thing I learned from Chris was I credit him with giving me such a love of learning how to work on the fly. Yeah. It's not really done much today because it's not really taught. I feel young wrestlers of all wrestlers need to learn how to work on the fly because if something goes wrong in a match that you've put together and God knows people have put together matches A to Z, if you get lost, you know how to get back to where you need to go. 
Chris was so good and so fast and so crisp. He would just get in the ring with us, lock up. He would call this most incredible elongated spot on the fly. And even if you screwed up, he knew where to fix it until you got it right. Right. He was also very good about just telling stories. And he would always say to a lot of us, you may not understand what I'm saying to you now, right. but at a certain point, whether it's in the car, in a match, in a locker room, the light bulb's going to go off. Mm -hmm. And he was just very giving with knowledge because he loved the industry. And as YouTube started getting bigger and I got to see a lot more of his work that I had never seen whether it was fan cam footage from ECW shows to uh, just independent wrestling shows that he had appeared on, I understood in those matches I could then tell where he's literally just working on the fly and calling this stuff as he's in the ring. Right. People don't realize how good he was. I never got to work with him on a show. My partner, Danny Moff has, it was one of his first, I think his first singles match. Wow. And I'll let, if you ever talk to Danny, uh, please ask him about that match. The story wow. behind it is incredible that you would almost think it's not believable, but it right. actually is. But, kindest person you will ever meet who was just a fan who loved the he loved business it. and he was so unique and very funny you bring him up because i was just talking to my students a couple of months ago you know it's funny when you watch matches on youtube and that match is over or that whatever you're watching it always gives you the next suggested yeah. thing to watch you can really go down a rabbit hole on that and I just happened to put on a match and it had suggested. And it was Chris Candido against AJ Styles. Some indie show, I think, in like Arkansas or Tennessee. That sounds right, because that's where AJ was doing a lot of stuff after WCW. It went like 15 minutes. And I'm telling you, this building probably had no more than 80 to 100 people. And Chris is working this match like there's 5,000 people in there. And that, and, but that was the standard of an era, right? Yes. Like, and when, that's, Eddie, like when Eddie Guerrero correct. went to Ring of Honor, correct. he didn't relax. Correct. And, and, I, and I get from the standpoint of maintaining the miles and the compression on your body, but there was an era of wrestler that there was a standard, and whether it was 50 or 5,000, you didn't go below that standard. And I think that's why, say what you will about their work rate, Mm -hmm. um, to a degree, but I think that's why at the big at the '90s version of the Indies, that's why guys like Bundy, Albano, and all those people were constant fixtures on the Indies. Valentine Beefcake, because say what you will, they brought the television level energy. Correct. You know, and and Chris was was no exception. Like a lot of great talents of that era. And that is how I approach my matches. That is how Moff approaches yeah. matches. When we team, that's how we approach our matches. We don't care how many people are in the building. There is no such volume control on us yeah. of, hey, let's take it easy. Right. No. To me, that paying customer deserves 100% of every ounce of your ability to go in there and entertain them. That's a mindset that I still have to this day. The last thing I'll say about Chris, and, and I've said this to young wrestlers too, the biggest piece of advice he ever gave me and a few others in a locker room in Wildwood, New Jersey, when uh, they would do spot shows there, um, he always said, do not take yourself seriously Take what you do inside the ring right. seriously. Chris had no problem as a heel getting and putting egg on his face to make the baby yeah. face look incredible. And yet here we have wrestlers today 
oh, uh, my character wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't look weak like that. Yeah. Yeah. I wrestled in a Tinkerbell costume on a Halloween show. With with above average legs. <laughs> and a pretty good bust, too. So, um, uh, uh, anyway, but... It's, it's funny, because uh, my current gripe with the with the tough man mentality is uh remember when when heel wrestlers would get slapped and they would sell that like the ultimate disrespect and then Ricky Morin like taught women how to slap because if you do it right you know you know kind of revealing the magic here but the point is now we've hit an era where the heel has to do the terminator snap because god forbid he takes that that disrespect and sell you know sell the slap but you know, yet a 16-time world champion in Ric Jesus, Flair yes. would take a slap and he would drop to a knee in defiance of, holy shit. Yeah. What right. did this guy just do to me? And, like, and, here he is, and then there he was at 70 with his daughter getting slapped every week and he's selling the shit out of it for them. Yeah. And, he does, and, he, and that's at a point where you don't have to. And don't get me wrong, right? There's a time and a place and a flavor of wrestling for that. But a heel's job is to be the heel, right? right? Be the coward. It's you can be the coward. Eventually, the baby face has to have the comeuppance. If the heel is right there on the baby face every time, the baby face is never going to get over. The heel has to be a heel, right? right? There, don't tell me when I ask you, okay, uh, why are you a heel? Oh, well, I do this and this and that. How does that make you a heel? Just because you can yell at the crowd doesn't make you a right. heel. Right. The art of a heel in a match is to do everything illegally behind the referee's back. Right. That is what makes you a heel. If you can tell that story and find a way to screw the baby face you can tell that story just because you beat a baby face clean with your finisher doesn't make you a heel right now it can if it something chicanery leads up to that and right. again people can say that my level of psychology is very old or it's withered it's in the past wrestling psychology never gets old the basics do not go out of style right right you can go ahead and be that strong style heel all you want and do all these right. crazy moves. I'll do what I do. And I would like to say who gets the better reaction. You know what I mean? And to, and to that's, bring the point that yeah. if say, say what you will about your style, quote unquote, withering, to bring it up to modern times, if you will, go back to Cody and Gunther. Gunther was bested by Cody with a pin that he did not expect from his arsenal. Cody... Cody was going for the finish. That was Gunther was more prepared for, so he was going for his bread and butter, the sleeper. Cody gets him on a flash pin, and mm -hmm. Gunther's like, okay, you bested me. I, I may not respect you, but I accept that you bested me. Mm -hmm. And that's what saved him from, look at week, he lost to Cody. Right. The most there's, at there's the end middle, of the day. There's a yes. middle ground for both. Correct. Uh, and I always say if a heel plays their part correctly and a baby face plays their part correctly, sure. if they go into a match at equal level, even at the end of the match, no matter who wins or loses, both can be elevated. 100%. As long as you play that part and you play right. that role and you commit to it, right? right. That's yeah. how it is. And, and again, and going back to that, the, Roman Reigns' title reign ended, right? But I promise you, his legacy went even further because of that title reign ending. Correct. I you agree know, with you hundred percent. You know. So yeah, uh, that's just uh, that's just the level of. But yes, I would tell any wrestler out there, yeah. find Chris Candido's work and study it. Because because I love I love the the relationship you two have. Uh, when do you in your life encounter Dan Moff? And when do you kind of have that? Oh, that's my guy. Because I, when I met you, you guys were just kind of establishing that for us, for the audience. And uh, if you remember, I think it was California. Forgive me if I got the state wrong. I know it was, I think it was West Coast. You guys had just like 
went to war with each other. It's the match where he pulls a spike out of his boot, and then he they, the crowd calls him a sick fuck, and he hands you another one. And I'm here. I am. I hadn't seen this match, and Danny's talking about it, and I'm like reveling in his explanation of this match. You guys did pre-pandemic. Maybe that's why you're forgetting. Okay, I know what you're talking about. Yes, I know. Yes. 2020 was a terrible yeah. decade. But pre-pandemic, yes. um, you guys just kind of went to war to each other, and then you realize maybe the money is not in the war, but it's in the battle of the two of us facing everyone else. Because I remember you guys doing the stuff with Bear Country and even vignettes lead into that and other teams in the indies mm-hmm. and such. Um, when do you meet and establish your your relationship with, with Dan Moff? Because we can't, we kind of can't not talk no. about him. And I appreciate you bringing and him the up. Same, and the um, same about if if talk, when I talk about him, I, I yeah. don't stray from you either. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> let, let's you know, it's again very interesting, right? Danny started uh, a few years before me in the late '90s. He's got about yeah. three years ahead of me uh, from when he joined uh, Jersey All Pro, and you know, then went to the Doghouse and, and LIWF yeah. and trained with Homicide and Loki and all those guys, but. Uh, I had actually gone and had seen Dan in a number of matches when him and Steve were first starting out at Charity Hall in Bayonne for Jersey All Pro. Oh, yeah. And I even said back then that the, the Hit Squad and Homicide are the three craziest motherfuckers that I would never want to be alone on a street with. Fast forward, right? And again, we talk about the independence and how they were on the East Coast, Jersey All Pro in the early 2000s was like an entity unto itself. Very few individuals in Jersey All Pro really worked a lot of outside promotions. Yes. And a lot of people on the East Coast who worked at outside promotions didn't really work for Jersey All Pro. So... Moff and I had actually never met each other when we were in the industry Mm. until I met him working out at the same gym that I worked out in and didn't know he worked out there in 2015. Wow. Just, you know, saw him, went up, said hello. He was very uh, bothered as Danny always is when people bother him in a gym. Um, But that's okay. You know, we had mutual friends and and whatever the case may be. But I never really met and got to talking to him until I had come to WrestlePro um, and started training at the school um, because I needed a new home because IWF had uh, closed down. But, uh, you know, our relationship started when Dan saw me at a training session grappling with uh, one of the heavenly bodies and and Mark Carino um, and just saw that there was something there and he knew just... Right, the bodies became... Yeah. yeah. And just knew that (sighs) I had something there because of the way that I moved and the way that I do things. And he was the guy that vouched for me to say hey we we need a guy like him and through that he and i just started having conversations and really realized that we're just both one in the same in terms of our love of old school wrestling and how we developed our own psychology based off of that old school wrestling in the 70s and the 80s and the grittiness of it And then we had wrestled a couple of matches against each other, and we were at a WXW show together. Uh, We drove together and didn't even know what the matches were, but I I guess the individual that Dan, if I remember correctly, was supposed to team with that night, something happened, and he suggested me teaming with him. And we ended up working the main event against uh, Alpha Jr. and Lance. Yeah. It was a WXW reunion show. I was going to say, this was one of the uh, anniversary reunion shows, yes. Right. And was this, uh, this wasn't at the battlefield, though, right? This was at the building. Fire. No, this was in somewhere way deep in PA. Uh, I yeah, think it was yeah. Sunbury uh, was the town, because even Rocky <laughs> Johnson was on the show. Yeah, I, I remember um, the flyer, actually. And... Uh, 
I remember at one point in the Ma in the match, Moff tagged me in um, and he said, uh, look behind you. And as I'm getting in the ring and I turn, Sika is standing up, up clapping. Didn't know what it was about, but whatever the case may be. Uh, went through, had a great match with them, came to the back, and I remember uh, Sika talking to Moff, and I came up to, like I would always, show respect and just asked if he had any advice if he had seen the match. And he gave both of us great advice and really appreciated the old school style. Yeah. Didn't really think anything of it. And we were just working out together one day at that same gym. And he just said, you know, what if we teamed? Like, right. I think that'd be different. It'd be cool. I said, okay. We tried it and just magic was there. And I think it was because the fact that he and I started really gel in our personal lives as friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's just where it grew. And it just continued to grow and grow and grow. And the more we became friends, the more we developed that in-ring chemistry as well. And that's where it took us. It took us all over the East Coast to Chaotic yeah. in Massachusetts uh, to um, Rhode Island for XWA to California for Sheik and PCW. And that's where the whole Spike thing came into play yeah. there. Um, you know, and then Danny, you know, got the opportunity to be re-signed by Ring of Honor just before the pandemic. Yeah. He was signed to an exclusive contract, which means he could not work the indies anymore. Yeah. So obviously that led to a two-year hiatus with the industry being nowhere in 2020 yeah. and only just starting to grow legs again in 2021. But, you know, he was kind of just in a mode of kind of doing his own thing. I was back doing my own thing a little bit. And it took a little bit um, uh, until literally through some, uh, again, we talk about how you always pay it forward and be respectful yeah. of everybody. Um, one of the gentlemen from the now who was at the time working for the NWA had put a bug in somebody's ear with the Crockett cup coming up yeah, and reached out to us and said, Hey, do you have a real or matches like that we could send on the technologically inclined individual of the two? Yes. Um, and the Crockett cup was the first time we had teamed in a couple of years since the pandemic, but also because that was legitimately my second match back from having knee surgery and being yeah. out for almost a year. But that just started the wheels turning it because that match was like we hadn't even like stopped teaming. Sure. Just the chemistry was there. And I said, let's, there's no, there's no, we had a goal the first time around. The second time around is let's just go have fun. Right, right. And that's where we're at now. And just having that fun allows us to just be crazy on these promos. Yeah. One take Jake's. We're just having fun, okay. but we just know each other's personality and how we can make it work in promos. We're, we're, we're constantly talking about ideas for matches and not necessarily for us, our opponents. How do we right. make our opponents look great? So that's where it came from. And it's like, we're just having fun at this point. We're enjoying the time we have in the industry now and, and what we can give back and working with talent um, and just having fun on these shows and helping to leave the industry better than the way we found it. You know, uh, I consider Danny and I journeymen in this industry. You know, we're not necessarily household names. We know it. I mean, Danny is more of the name than me and I, say that with all the respect in the world. No, and, but and I, no... I think there is, I think there is, in fact, say what you will about the level of it to mm -hmm. meet you in the middle. There is an aura, there is a reaction, a response, and it is immediate when some guys' names are mentioned and you two are, are two of those names. I appreciate that, but I will always say that Danny is a legitimate legend in this business, not just for his longevity, oh, where yeah. he came from, where he started, the, the individuals he has 
got me the ability me. to work. So, and, and there are days where I just pick his brain on things about psychology and yeah. Hey, and, and we help pick my brain and we'll just, we'll talk about ideas. And I think it just helps make the both of us better. Um, but that's, you know, think that just all comes down to just being, you know, brothers without being blood related. Right. Um, you know, uh, that's just what happens when two individuals just click on a personal and, and a professional level and just wanting to see the other do well. Yeah. Um, and it's genuine. It's From a no, genuine place. Yeah. Yeah. There's no back ended comment or things of that nature. Like, just two guys who want to see each other do well. When yeah. we're when he's booked on a show on a weekend and I have a weekend off, we'll still talk. Hey, how was that show? Yeah. What went right? What went wrong? You know, how was yeah. your match? Like, and we just we pick each other's brains, and that's uh what good tag partners do. You're always yeah. in the game, so to speak, um, trying to make each You're other better. Even. Yeah, absolutely. Uh before I get into the question, I think that leads from the damn mop navigation. You want mm -hmm. an above average damn off story? Sure. So I'm at the Morgan Junior Arena, the building in Wallington where we first met for mm -hmm. Ace. And and I don't remember who it was. It might have even been <laughs> it might have even been either Keith Lee or Donovan Dijak. And we had the headsets back then. And then we had it where Mike could listen in. And if there was something he wanted us to get across or give direction to, he would give us those things he didn't micromanage us like the the horror stories you hear about other places but if there was something he wanted he would get it out there so this is during one of moff's title reigns and one of his last ones there and he's coming back and mike like showing guys the building veterans and yeah you could do this and that or whatever so this is during like the third match and all of a sudden i hear orgasmic moans in my ear orgasmic moans in my ear and 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 mop and mike are simulating sex all right like a bunch of school children in my ear and oh. and, and uh it ends with mike saying oh the next time we do this you have to take on off your ring it hurts too much and this is joking around mop comes and goes no that was my watch puppy <laughs> So this is on the first half of the show. And during intermission, during intermission, I have a brief time to run around, get my water, inhale a, an empanada, whatever. And I see him off and he's, you know, he's in the zone, right? He's, he's still got three matches to go and he's, you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about? Oh and, yes. You know, he's got his shoulders up to his ears. He's snorting out, you know, like the fucking gorilla he is. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I straight, I see him walking away to from me, not on purpose, walking away as I'm walking up to him. And I hit him with the fucking promo, turn his back around, and I said, Hey. And he's like, he's he's looking at me like ready to kill me. And I'm like, hey man, the next time you fuck my ear, you buy me dinner. And he breaks. He just breaks <laughs> and loses it right there. And he goes, You got it. And we just hugged. Tremendous. Tremendous. Went back, went back, called the show. Got, yeah, got over. I, I you yeah, know it, it, one of the things that uh, I love about uh, the guys from my era, uh, and even Dan, you know, from that era too, yeah. is that we know we're in a different society today. We yes. know ribs yeah. really can't exist today. Even fun ribs can't exist. Yeah, but to those you know, you can. Right. We rib each other and yeah. our friends consistently because yeah. it just keeps us having fun and right. going. It could be, you know, there's nothing, there's no crazy, like, serious ribs or things of that nature. It's just us having fun with right. each other and busting each other's balls. And that's yeah. that's what makes being in the locker room even that much more fun. But, uh, you know, he is still a tremendous performer in his not own not. right for the longevity that he is. And look, yeah. yes, we call him the Benjamin Button of pro wrestling for a reason, because the older he gets, the better he gets. Right. Right. And uh, he is Pedro Morales' son. Now, yes, he is. <laughs> with, with that, I want to let let's get to it. Let's get to the draw. Um mm -hmm. 
we've talked about some of your discrepancies with professional wrestling business, some of which can be their own episodes and out of itself. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into more information. Alex Ryman, Richfield Park, Steve Off, Shane Fair, things of these nature, all conglomerated into one. We had a conversation about wrestling venues. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think I'm going to go across the list here. Let's start at the ethos. Is Dan Moff... And the relationship, the catalyst for your behavior and your actions towards Alex Ryman is is what is transpiring in front of us between you and Pro Wrestling Magic as an entity Mm -hmm. with Alex Ryman at the forefront, at the mask of that ship. Is it a generational thing? Is it a you piss off my brother, you piss me off? Walk me through the, the ethos of... What your gripe is. I don't think anybody's asking you mm-hmm. the right questions, personally. I'm not trying to justify or, your verbiage or your behavior. No, no, no. That's or okay. Matt or Steve or Alex or any of those guys. Yep. But I don't think anybody has straight said, what is your problem? Sure. And, and I appreciate you asking me the question. None of this of where it's transpired has actually anything to do with Moff and whatever he's done with Alex and Pro Wrestling Magic. I will be the first person to say it. Alex Ryman is a tremendous in-ring performer who has only gotten better as he has transformed his body. I personally think Alex has a very big future in this industry but I do feel that he is wasting his best times away in that building, in that company that used to be prestigious. How do you go from guys like Keith Lee and Cody Rhodes selling out that building to what you see now? Are you trying to say that because ultimately in pro wrestling, we create new stars Correct. All promotions, specifically in the Indies, be it as a local legend or transcending Mm -hmm. into television. Absolutely. Alex Ryman, without question, has gotten the more fruits of his labor at Pro Wrestling Magic. I'm not saying today, but do you think long term that is not the guy to carry the load? Do you not think that's the investment that pays dividends? Because ultimately, while I respect some of these talents and I have worked with some of them, Keith Lee, Cody Rhodes, in the moment, on the independent, successful runs. Correct. They're television talents, and you have to be prepared, including if the day comes for Alex Ryman. Right. He's got as much a shot as anybody else. You have to be prepared for when those guys are not around. Not because they don't want to. Correct. But, but so, is a calling. Yeah. So, but again, let's talk other people to lead that charge, right? Dan Moff, Darius Carter. Great guys, great in-ring performers. Alex, I put up there too. Here's the issue. The day will come for Alex to not be the guy there. Who do you go to? Look at the majority of the guys on that roster. Where else do they work? Yes, but barely that anywhere, said, right? Barely with anywhere. That, because with that being said, I'm not gonna yes. discredit that. No, but of course. some will in fact call out the validity of your statement because mm-hmm. of your association mm-hmm. to a moff, to a okay. Darius Carter. And while yes, they are in fact upper tier performers, sure. maybe even second to none by comparison to some, but because of the fact that by association, right, right, they're gonna oh, that's that's your brother, brother. Mm-hmm. But okay, if people want to go back to statements. Before my association, even with Darius Carter, in our podcast, I still had the same views of Ridgefield Park and the quote-unquote Mecca, right? Here's the thing. What do independent promoters do a lot of times when they see a great building? Everybody wants to latch onto it, right? So... If I can see performer A on this show in that building for $20 or see that same performer on another show a week later for $15, why wouldn't I save money, right? The problem with that building is so many people work there of the same name for multiple, multiple companies in that building month after month. You water yourself down. 
and a lot of that. Are you trying to say that Shane Fair's moniker of Ridgefield Park is is not uh, at any way of any value? No, it's it's a great venue because yes, a lot of good companies have ran there and have sold out that building, but the people that do sell out that building are the people that know what they're doing. If you were to give Ridgefield Park a name that was not the Mecca, what would it be? The Dump. What in particular is it about Shane Fair that you're I, not fond of? I have no issue with in, Shane in his, Fair. I his, actually in like in his Shane Fair. In his statements of his passion for mm -hmm. that building. He and I can agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. And that should be like any professional, right? I like Shane Fair a lot. I think the world of him, I think he's a tremendous in-ring announcer. I disagree with calling that place the Mecca. Because if you're going to call someplace a Mecca, you have to have the legitimacy and the legacy behind it with moments that transcend time. That's my view. I don't think there are many great moments out of that building. And that's my personal opinion. Where it translates, and, and the bigger picture is really not the building. The bigger picture is Alex, right? It started as a fun joke. Just a little bit of back and forth between the two of us as peers. It grew. And when, it grew. When do you feel the line was crossed on your end? Hmm. Some are going to easily point out to you in in essence, trespassing on a show. Sure. Some are going to easily point out you inserting yourself in a steel cage mm -hmm. in many a post-match situation. Sure. For you, so, yes. when was the line crossed by Alex? Was so, it so I, So the, the line so was crossed when you when he brought my family into this, right? People should realize in any area of pro wrestling, right, if you're working stories with people or whatnot, never cross the line and bring people's family into it because that's not where that belongs. He crossed that line. So for me, you're right. The incident where I locked him inside the cage, yeah, I crossed that line. But that was a given reason why I had to cross that line. I'm a grown man. You do not mess with a man's family. You do not utter that man's family's name. Now, where it really crossed the line, and I had no idea, was his father was in attendance that night. Didn't know that. But, hey, got to take advantage of the situation. Point, you certainly made it a point to address him. Oh, I did. that comments during yep. the match and even after. Well, that's because he was there. But I brought him up because of the fact that, again, as a man, eye for an eye. Are you satisfied with the brutality and the outcome it gave you at Christmas party under Pro Wrestling Magic? 100%. With that confidence, is this a dead issue for you? Yes, I have. For you? Yes, I have no rhyme or reason to go back to that building. I have no rhyme or reason to do anything related to business with pro wrestling magic. And I want nothing to do with Alex Raymond. Far as I'm concerned, I'm moving on and doing with what I need to do in my career. And I think Alex needs to do the same thing. Now, despite the fact that Steve off ultimately booked you, um, allowed you in Sol Ackerman and said, Hey, you have a grievance. Let's air it for the magic kingdom. Mm -hmm. you're satisfied with ultimately no winner, no loser, but you're clearly stating in a way mm -hmm. that you and Ryman are not equals. Correct. So how can you be satisfied with the no contest ruling? Because I set out to do something, and that was to prove a point to Alex. It is that you do not mess with a man's family. Because to me, I didn't care about a win or a loss in that match. What I cared about was 
emotionally, physically, and mentally dissecting that individual. And that's exactly what I did. It's no different than fighting somebody out on the street. The only difference was we were not held liable for what our actions would be. Now, I know Alex is a tough customer. I'm bruised up. I'm beat up. I pulled about 70 tacks out of my back. You know, I got a nice cut on my forehead that, you know, it'll heal. But I proved my point to Alex. Now it's a dead issue for me. I wish him well in his future career and whatever he decides to do. And I'm going to do what I need to do for my career. What do you feel with your expertise is the future of Alex Ryman's career, especially now that you are out of it? Mm -hmm. And do you see Alex Ryman as a player in the industry, in the independence? Yes, I do. I've seen it from day one. And I have said it in other interviews. I will always put over Alex for his in-ring ability and what he has done to transform <clears throat> himself. Sky is the limit for him. But he needs to remove himself from that bubble. And he needs to go out into that world and ply his craft in front of a bigger audience because he has the goods 100%. This is not me putting anything personally there, right? I will call a pro's pro. He knows what he's doing in that ring and he has the ability to be a major player anywhere he goes. But for you, mm -hmm. the issue verbally, physically, mm -hmm. has hit finality. Correct. And you're okay with that? Absolutely. And 100%. Do feel, and do you feel, to kind of put a button on this, do you feel Alex Ryman is worthy of your time for another physical encounter? Yes, he is worthy of my time in another encounter. But it has to be under the right circumstance and it has to be professional, not personal. The personal stuff with me and him, to me, is done. So if he wants something else from me in terms of another physical encounter, it has to be business related. Well, I can tell you that as a fan... I'm not okay with that answer. Um, okay. I cannot speak for Alex. Uh, I will inform you that I am trying to get Alex on the program. Sure. Uh, this will come up. I'm not going to dance around it. This okay. will come up. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, uh, if if that if that's the the ending of the first film, and then we're not going to get a sequel. I, I do believe that uh, wrestling fans, respectfully, Coach Donovan, have been slighted. I'm not putting that blame on you because, to be fair, I haven't spoken to Alex yet. Maybe this is an issue for him, too. We sure. saw him crawl out of the Magic Kingdom. We saw your work laid it in front of us. Maybe for him this is over. Not out of fear, but out of safety. Or who knows what. But as a fan, I'm not processing that that was the end. And I 100% respect your stance on that. Sometimes in wrestling, the fans don't always get to go home happy. Right. It's no different than a cliffhanger on AEW or WWE when they're furthering a story. What I can tell you the difference here is there is no cliffhanger here. It, it's over and it's done. One and done. Well... Be that as it may, that's something for everyone to process. Uh, we're now up to the uh, to the rapid fire uh, part of the evening. Sure. Um, the one name that I almost was going to wrestle and it didn't come to fruition, the Great White Buffalo question, if you will. Mm. One and name. If you didn't have one where the match was set and it didn't happen, the one person that you wish you could have and you think you got close enough and it just didn't happen. 
Wow, that's a very uh, interesting uh, question. Um, the only thing I could think of in recent memory, and he's a young performer that I think the world of, that the match almost happened, but due to injury, he could not do it, uh, was a battle of generations, me versus Jordan Oliver. Wow. I would have I would have loved to have seen that. I think the world of, of Jordan. He's wonderful. Yes. I remember since he started. Uh, yes. Your favorite ring gear of your rookie year, and I ask that specifically because, you know, the spiky hair, of your rookie year and of your uh, current look. So rookie year, my favorite gear was the long tights that I wore that I was trying to model the look after Bret Hart's gear, but ended up looking like a combination of Bret Hart's gear and Dean Malenko's gear. Okay, that's interesting. It's just um, the way the designer, you know, made yeah, it and translated it yeah of the modern, era? modern era it's the current the current look now the updated logo the long um leather sleeveless trench coat um yeah that's that's my favorite look um i i feel like i continue to get better with the look as i continue to evolve and i think that it yeah. just continues to get better creatively I do this wrestling move better than anybody on on your show. DDT. The most underrated finisher of all time. Wow. Hmm. Underrated finisher of all time? I would have to say the million dollar dream. Interesting. Because that... that that is considered one of the best and usually on a list in the first in the first 25 out of 50. That's and I say it's the most underrated because it's also a move that you can do to anybody big or small. Sure. Sure. The high hanging fruit, the one guy I haven't wrestled, but yet I really would like to. Ryan Davidson out of reality of wrestling. Okay. Uh, I'm currently tape studying. Finish the sentence. Uh, I am currently tape studying Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher from uh, AWA, Minnesota, Wisconsin area. If you haven't watched this match, what are you doing? Chris Candido versus Matt Stryker from Cyberspace Wrestling. Find it on YouTube. The one match that changed my life that I either saw or was in. The one match that changed my life. Ric Flair versus Terry Funk. Clash of the Champions. You may not know this, but I also have this hidden talent. <laughs> hmm. I'm a grill master. Really? And because you're a Paisan, sauce or gravy? <laughs> sauce. Okay. My heart level is normal again. All right. <laughs> uh, if you ask me, uh, this was a clinic. I'm glad my cardio was up to space. And, and, I, and I knew right away talking to you long form, because through the years I've kind of hit you up uh, on and off through Messenger, and you've always given a – uh, great feedback, and I and I hope I can continue this rapport with you. One hundred percent, you're a pros bro. And um, I really, I I get very, uh, I'll just say it emotional at the end of these things because I am very grateful in and out of wrestling for everybody that gives me their time. And you were, you were not shortchanging me or those who have listened uh, to this. I'm glad that you were extremely open, uh, transparent, and even visceral. Uh, in all of your answers, and and I really think that on top of being a podcast and an interview, this particular episode was an education. There's nothing you can't take out of this, and I think that's what makes you such an exceptional coach, only because I try to have a digestible show, unlike these other people, no offense. Uh, I'm not going to get into how you became a coach or, or what you do as a coach for WrestlePro, but I think your ethos has explained why you're in the situation that you're in as a coach 
and as a talent and why many of us, maybe not Alex Ryman, consider you to be a talent of a certain level. And I thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. As I said, you're a pro's pro. You ask very thought provoking questions. Uh, you have studied your craft tremendously. I appreciate that. Uh, I am available anytime you'd love me to come back on and I am a message away. Anytime you want to talk about things, see a different perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm a message away as I tell many talents. Yeah. I, I, and, and it's genuine. So if you're, yes. if you have the opportunity that I just had, you should take it like many things. And anybody who watches this, I will say this. I love studying the independence. I love studying the people that are coming up. If I can provide advice to anybody, reach out to me, send me a match. I'll be more than happy to watch it, give feedback, constructive criticism. If you just have a question about something in your career you're looking to do, I'll be more than happy to give you my take on it. Doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. It's just a flavor of ice cream. Right, right. It's uh it's it's an opinion, but it's valued. And I think that's I think that's what everybody should take away. Ladies and gentlemen. The Messiah of old school, the ridiculer of Ridgefield Park, and <laughs> and uh, a true wrestler in every sense of the word, Sean Donovan. This is the voice, Sean Ortiz. The following conversation has been scheduled for one fall. Fans, we'll see you next time.